Good day, I am uh, Dr. Thekia Palata, a clinical microbiologist, and um, we are going to discuss hepatitis D virus. And welcome to our lecture series on uh, hepatitis. So if you missed our previous lectures, we had an overview um, uh, an overview lecture on hepatitis. We have uh, a lecture on hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and now we are going to discuss hepatitis D infection. So hepatitis D is a liver disease that uh, that is that 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 is both acute it can be acute and chronic and it it is caused by hepatitis d virus and this virus requires hepatitis b for its replication so what am i saying what i'm saying is that hepatitis d infection cannot occur in the absence of hepatitis b virus so then we will see later during the prevention of hepatitis D is that although we don't have a successful uh, licensed vaccine against hepatitis D, but if you take preventive measures, you know, uh, against hepatitis B, then you prevent also the occurrence of hepatitis D. Hepatitis D infection occurs only simultaneously, so it can occur simultaneously, that we call co-infection with hepatitis B, or someone with a hepatitis B then will contract hepatitis D later, that's what we call super infection. So you will find that um, when you do a serologic test, you need to be able to identify whether it was a co-infection. It means that the patient contracted both viruses at the same time, there was a co-infection, or the person has hepatitis B infection before and superimposed with uh, hepatitis D. So hepatitis D and B co-infection is considered the most severe form of chronic viral hepatitis due to more rapid progression toward uh, liver-related death and hepatocellular carcinoma. So the superinfection is less severe than the co-infection. So the co-infection is very complicated. And this is the structure of uh, hepatitis D virus. It is a RNA virus and it has a, a S antigen just like a hepatitis B and you have a delta antigen that is there. So let's look at the global distribution of uh, hepatitis D infection. A 2020 study estimated that hepatitis D affect globally almost 5% of people who have a chronic infection with hepatitis B. So if you take the total population with hepatitis B, all people who are infected with hepatitis B, 5% of them will develop hepatitis D, according to the latest statistics. And that hepatitis D co-infection could explain about one in five cases of liver disease and liver cancer. Remember I say that hepatitis B and D co-infection leads to much more severe form as compared to hepatitis B uh, superimposed with, uh, hepatitis B superimposed with hepatitis D. The study has identified several geographical hotspots of a high prevalence hepatitis D infection, it's including Mongolia, Republic of Moldova, and the countries in Western and Middle Africa are worstly affected. So how is the transmission done? The routes of hepatitis D transmission are the same as for hepatitis B, and it's mainly percutaneously or sexually through contact with infected blood or blood product, injecting drug user, permucosal exposure, vertical transmission is also possible, but a bit rare. Vaccination against hepatitis B prevents hepatitis D co-infection. That's what I said. 
because you cannot get hepatitis D infection without hepatitis B. So if we vaccinate people against hepatitis B, B we prevent them from contracting hepatitis D. So as a result, the expansion of childhood hepatitis B immunization program has resulted in the decline in hepatitis D incidence worldwide. So who is at risk for hepatitis D? First, all chronic carrier of hepatitis B infection are at risk because those are the people, if they did not contract the hepatitis D the same time when they contract hepatitis B, then they will develop uh, an infection that can be what we call a super infection. People who are not immune to hepatitis B, they are also at risk because they might develop a co-infection those who are more likely to have hepatitis B and D co-infection, those ones include mainly people who inject drugs because you can inject the two viruses at the same time. Antigenous people, people with hepatitis C or HIV infection, they are also found to, to have high risk of co-infection. Um, the risk of co-infection also appears to be potentially higher in a recipient of hemodialysis men who have sex with men and commercial sex workers. The rate is also very high. Migration from uh, high hepatitis D prevalence countries to lower prevalence areas might have an effect on the epidemiology of the host countries. Uh, this is just something obvious. So now the clinical features, we will have two main clinical features. The first one is co-infection with hepatitis B. So hepatitis D co-infection with hepatitis B. We say that this gives you mainly a severe acute hepatitis, severe form of uh, hepatitis. You know, simultaneous infection with hepatitis B and D can lead to mild to severe or even permanent form of hepatitis, but recovery is usually complete and the development of chronic hepatitis D is rare. It's less than 5% of uh, acute hepatitis. And this is especially low risk of chronic infection. So this is the co-infection. That is usually a severe form. It will lead to fulminant hepatitis. Now the super infection form is also there and hepatitis D can then infect a person who is already infected with hepatitis B. That's what we call super infection uh, to hepatitis B. So super infection of hepatitis D on chronic hepatitis B accelerates progression to a more severe disease in all ages and in 70 to 90 percent of people. You know, so hepatitis D super infection accelerates progression to cirrhosis almost a decade earlier than hepatitis D mono infected person. So the co infection or super infection with hepatitis B is still a major concern, you know, toward the progress of uh, chronic hepatitis B infection, development of cirrhosis, and the liver cancer. The mechanism in which hepatitis D causes more severe hepatitis and the faster progression of fibrosis than hepatitis B alone remains still unclear. It's still unclear why, uh, by which mechanism it does that. Usually, develop chronic hepatitis D infection, high risk of severe chronic liver disease may present as an acute hepatitis. So in terms of screening and diagnosis, hepatitis D infection is diagnosed by high levels of uh, immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M anti-hepatitis D virus and confirmed by detection of hepatitis D RNA in a serum. So you can screen first by doing a serology, looking at uh, uh, IgM or IgG, then you can confirm by doing a PCR, looking for the presence of hepatitis D uh, RNA in the serum. 
However, hepatitis D diagnostics are not widely available and there is no standardization for even the hepatitis D RNA assays, which are used for monitoring responses. So mainly we rely on serologic tests, but then you can do PCR to monitor response to the treatment. Hepatitis B surface antigen is useful also to monitor treatment response if quantitative uh, hepatitis D uh, RNA is not available. So you can use uh, uh, hepatitis C, S, S, hepatitis B, S antigen, you know, as a marker for monitoring response to treatment. Because decreasing hepatitis B, S antigen levels often herald surface antigen loss and hepatitis D clearance. Although the surface antigen loss is rare in the treatment, but it is found to play a major role, especially in a resource-limited setting where you might not have the PCR facilities. So when you do serology, this is how the co-infection looks like between B and D, hepatitis B and D viruses. So you can see here above hepatitis B surface antigen is increasing and the hepatitis D RNA is following the same pattern, you know, but then the S antigen, hepatitis B S antigen is decreasing, you know, because it needs usually, according to the natural history, after six months, it needs to decrease but hepatitis D can be persistent for a while, then it will start decreasing later on. Then um, you will then have a development of uh, um, IgM anti-hepatitis D that will also follow the same pattern by anti-S antigen will occur later on, you know, um, around six months following uh, exposure. So, if you have a, this tells you that there was a co-infection because hepatitis B S antigen and hepatitis D RNA follow and IgM anti-hepatitis D follow the same pattern. They follow the same pattern. But this is different in a case of super infection. In a case of super infection, you have, uh, uh, it's different. The surface antigen is there. You know, it means that, uh, this patient has already chronic hepatitis B infection going on, then you will have then, a, you know, a, an increase, uh, starting to have an increase of IgM anti uh, D antigen uh, antibodies that starts increasing. And if you do also the PCR, you will see that uh, these um, uh, hepatitis D RNA will occur later on, you know, while the patient already have uh, hepatitis B uh, infection. So the, the, the response is different. So the co-infection, uh, the picture is different from the super infection. In the super infection, you have S antigen that is already there more than six months. It means that it's a chronic infection. And you can also find uh, uh, the presence of uh, IgM anti, uh, IgG anti co antigen to tell you that it's a chronic hepatitis B infection. Then you have a new increase of uh, uh, antibodies, anti hepatitis D, you know, that you can see visible on the graph. How do we treat hepatitis D? Current guideline generally recommend uh, pegylated interferon alpha for at least 48 weeks, irrespective of uh, uh, on treatment response patterns. You know, so the overall rate of sustained virological response is low. However, this treatment is independent factor associated with a lower likelihood of disease progression. So although the response is a bit um, not very strong, but it is the treatment that is recommended. More efforts are needed to reduce the global burden of chronic hepatitis B so that we can then uh, reduce the development of uh, hepatitis D. 
So that's why prevention and control of hepatitis D infection requires prevention of hepatitis B transmission through vaccinating people against hepatitis B, blood safety, injection safety, and reduction, harm reduction services. Hepatitis B immunization does not provide protection against hepatitis D for those who are already infected with hepatitis B infection. So if you already have a chronic hepatitis B, it just, you need to take a lot of precautions because you need to avoid developing a super infection with hepatitis D that will make the progression of your hepatitis B infection much more faster than you can develop uh, cirrhosis and uh, cancer of the liver. So hepatitis D and B co-infection, we need pre or post exposure prophylaxis for preventing hepatitis B. And for super infection, we really need to strengthen education to reduce risk behaviors uh, for people who already have chronic hepatitis B infection. So in conclusion, hepatitis D is a virus that requires hepatitis B for its replication. And hepatitis D infection occurs only simultaneously uh, that we call co-infection or as a super infection with hepatitis B. And hepatitis D and B co-infection is considered the most severe form of chronic viral hepatitis due to more rapid progression toward liver-related death and hepatocellular carcinoma. And currently, treatment success rates are generally low and hepatitis D infection can be prevented by hepatitis B immunization. So thank you very much and um, follow the last part of our lecture series on hepatitis while we will uh, discuss hepatitis E infection. Thank you, goodbye.